test, the same brothers and sisters in Christ came against them. <laughs> came against them and had him kicked out of the country. So he said, well, I, I go, I, hey, I'll go on down to South Africa. He goes down to South Africa and starts to prosper there. However, he goes into a service <laughs> with oil robbers, and he gets a word of the Lord there. And God said, I sent you to Rhodesia. <laughs> so now he knows he has to go back, but God has to make the way. Yeah. This one man goes, and because of the, what? The word of God that he has and the conviction in his heart, he starts this ministry, and he starts to minister to people, no matter where they are, no matter what stage they are. It may be in the colonialists who had been there and continue to have land. It may be the, those who were in squalor. He ministered to them. The church started off majority white, and it ended up majority black. <laughs> Tom Duchelle is his name, and his wife, who he had only been married to for three weeks, left and came over to this country with them. And they together have been at it for the past 40 years. 40 years, their ministry, uh, they just celebrated this year, 40 years. And so, so it made me consider the power of one, which is the topic for today, the power of one, with the subtitle, What Difference Can One Man Make? As you can see from, from what I've told you, uh, it can make a lot of difference. But what I realize is that one man cannot do it alone. I don't care how determined he is, how much of a word of the Lord he hears from God, how, what, how uh, given his heart is. He still cannot do it by himself. God has to send those who are, who are equipped and prepared and willing to follow the vision that God has given in order for what lives to be changed. And because of those who came in that time, because of those who supported him in his efforts at that time, those who were obedient to the word of the Lord, what happened was that they were able to see the fruit of it and see it prosper. It's interesting, we ain't able to see people operate how they should in the house of God, people who keep their feet in the house of God. People who are not subservient, but they are what? In subjection. Not what? By constraint, but willingly. Yes. Not because they can't lead, because they are leaders. Yes. Literally, pastors, scores of pastors in a church together and all serving. You would never know. You would think they were deacons. But you speak to them, the word of the Lord is in their mouth. Men and women working side by side, doing whatever is necessary to make it happen. So it made me consider the power of one. In that place of darkness, in a place where a civil war had broken out, and the colonialists were fighting to retain power, and the guerrillas led by Mugabe were, were, were fighting for their independence, fighting the civil war for their independence. That even in the midst of it, even political calamity, where lives were being lost, where all kind of atrocities were occurring, he still had to stay there and be that light. Not getting so what involved politically that you what? You become an affront what to God. It reminds me of the power of one of Jesus, the Christ, how he came and, and during his time, people were upset because he would not establish the order. Well, have you come to what? Establish the kingdom to Israel now? How long do we have to rule? Wait with what the, the enemy's foot on our necks? Well, Roman, what, government, as cruel and evil as they had been. Will you not come and what, and establish the kingdom now? And Jesus said, it's not in my time. Yeah. <laughs> That's all in the Father's hand, what time he's going to do that. But I've come to establish the kingdoms where? In your heart. I've come to establish the kingdom of God where? In your heart. And so what is that saying? That the kingdom, my kingdom of, this God, of God is not of this world. Because if the kingdom of God was, he said, my people would fight. But no, this is the time for the enemy to what? To ride. But even in the same time as the enemy is what? Is showing himself to what? To be leading and be the prince of the power of the air. 
or, or in control of this world, God says, I come to what takes the hearts of men. And that's where I want dominion at. I want to have dominion of your individual hearts. That if you will give your hearts to me, then my kingdom will be established. Behold, the kingdom of God is with men. And how does he do it? Not by power, not by might, but by my spirit, said the living God. So God is what? It's by his spirit empowering men and women of God to be able to do exactly what they could not do any other way by his spirit. And that's what God wants to do with us. No matter where we are, no matter what uh, uh, environment we find ourselves in, it may be a corrupt government. It may be uh, racism. It may be any of these isms that go on in our lives. But he comes, what, to, to sit on the table of our hearts, and now he rules, what, this land, this earth. Our bodies become the temple of the Holy Ghost. Our bodies become the temple of the living God. And wherever we go, we carry the presence of God with us. But here's the problem, that if we're not willing to do what it takes to come into the agreement with what? With the one. Then we'll continue to live our separate lives, individual lives, and have what we've always had. It's what we call insanity. You can't do what you've always done and expect different results. That is the definition of insanity. That you expect something different to happen, that the same cause is going to give you the same effect. And so... In the Bible, we see the power of one, the power of oneness. How when people come together with a desired goal, they are able to make many things happen. In Genesis 11, we see that there were uh, at, at this place called Babel, a people who desired to build a tower up into heaven. That they'll reach up and become like God themselves. They'll come to the place of God. We'll come face to face with him. And what did God say here in Genesis 11? He said what? Behold, the people is one. And they all have one language, and this they begin to do. And now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Do you know that God had to come down, change the languages in order to what? To cause them to not be able to understand each other. And then they went off about doing separate things because they couldn't understand each other. Writing... On the airplane, we, we went Ethiopian Airlines. I would not have understood any of the directions they gave unless they translated into English, which they did next. Going into service with people who speak English and Shona, uh, uh, they, they, they are now singing in English, but then at a certain point in time, they switch over and they start singing in Shauna. And they have the words on the screen with the translations under it. So you know exactly what you're singing in what English and in another language. It's a way that people can become one, even in worship, in their own what native tongue and what have a spirit of oneness and unity, but they don't feel like they're being dispossessed of their own culture. Well, you know, when they start singing in their own language in Shauna, it, it becomes what? Powerful, loud. So at the Tower of Babel, even when people had a plan that God did not agree with, that God was not in agreement with, he came down and put a destruction at it. But he said what? That if they had in mind to do it and they could do it, if he did not step in, how much more so would we be able to accomplish God's purposes in life if we what, came into agreement with God? Because now we don't have the God of our salvation fighting against us. We have God what, fighting on our part. Remember what he says? He says what? In Deuteronomy 28, your enemies, Israel, will come against you what? One way, but I will cause them to flee what? Seven different ways. So that speaks of what? A unity in attack, in attacking you, but God will cause them to be divided when it comes to what? People come and put harm to you. If you what? Stay in my covenant. If you stay in agreement with me, this is what I'll do. I'll call to oneness in even the destruction of your enemies. However, you look at the other 14, after verse 14 and go further in Deuteronomy 28, you will see where he says what? And now if you don't hearken to the voice of your Lord your God, and if you choose not to operate according to this covenant, then these things, all these curses will come upon you. You will start fleeing, what, seven different ways. You'll go against your enemy one way, and you'll flee seven ways. 
exact opposite. So when you see a lack of unity, you know that is not the presence of God in that place. It's not the, what, the will of God in that place. When you see disunity, it is actually a visible and tangible reality that God is not, uh, is not having free course. That those who are there are not allowing God to have his free course. Because if you want unity anywhere, this is what happens. This is what you must do. You have to bring unity with you. <laughs> You don't come to a place and expect to find unity. You come and bring unity with you. That you're going to what? Be the one that causes everything to come together. That no matter what it is, it blesses all, blessed are the peacemakers, right? Those who, who don't go, because this is what God says an abomination is, what? Those who spread discord among the brethren, right? God calls it an abomination. Why? Because if you sow discord, that means unity is broken. Blessed, for Psalms 133, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in what? Unity, in oneness. It's the power of one. He said that power of one is such that when I pour the anointing on the head of what? My leader, then that same anointing will cause itself to fall down the beard, the skirt, all the way to, to, the, to the skirt of Aaron. Because what, what happens? The self-same anointing will fall on from the least to the greatest, from everyone involved. And what is anointing? Anointing is the divine enablement of God. It causes you to be able to do what you otherwise could not do without him. And that anointing is not necessarily oil. We call it oil, but it is actually the spirit of God. That in that spirit of God, you will, you will see that you are able to do more when God enables you. So when you do your natural, then you find God starts to do his supernatural. That's the way they were able to do what they did in Harari. That's the way they're, that's, that's the way they're able to do what they're continuing to do in Harari. Despite all of the negative they see around, they become a light in a what? In a dark world, in a dark area. So... We have a powerful example of the oneness uh, uh, and, and coming to agreement with God. Powerful example in Acts chapter 2. What does it say there? And, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all in one accord in one place. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire and sat upon each of them. God's presence came in by the spirit of the living God. And this tangible uh, uh, evidence of his presence was everyone could see something different had happened. Yes, sir. You can tell one is because there will be a what? A something different that will happen that will declare that God is present and moving in his place. Uh -huh, uh -huh. When you don't have it, the absence of it lets you know that God is not having his way, his free course. Yeah. What, am, what am I saying? I'm saying when you don't see the evidence of God moving, it is an evidence that God is not moving in the individual lives. That's the evidence of it. It's the evidence that, that people have taken that light and hid it under the bushel. It's, it's, it's the evidence that, that people have said, what, instead of sharing what I have, I'm going to, what, hold it all to myself. It's the evidence that people have said, what, I'm not going to give any time to God in prayer. I'm going to, what, do what I want to do, watch my movie, watch my Netflix and chill. It's the evidence that, what, that people have said, I'm going to, what, go hang out, have fun, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. It's a reflection that what people have not come into agreement with what God has said, with the vision that God has declared. And that is problematic for the people of God. Because at some point in time, the same spirit, if these people were not in agreement, the same spirit that God wanted to unleash could not come. Why? Because he told them, go. 
to Jerusalem and wait there for the promise until you be imbued with power from on high and you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria and the uttermost parts of the world. You will be what? My martyrs. You will go and die for the very word that I put in your belly. How can you die for something that you don't believe in? How can you die for something you don't understand? You won't. And the death is not what going and laying down your life so you can pick it up again. The death is dying to yourself, to your own self-will, to your own selfishness, to your own what? Desires of your heart and what? Submitting yourself to the desire of God. The Mosaic paradigm is instructive. This is what we see in the Mosaic paradigm. The Mosaic paradigm is when God speaks to a man. Somebody say, God speaks to a man. That's what happens first. God speaks to a man. Well, well, there's some problems with that, right? The problem with it is that now I have to what? Believe what a man says. And look at all the stuff that we have in between us and what? A man. I can't trust no man. Look at how men have done me before. Look at how what? Somebody's taken advantage of me before. Look at what, what has happened to me before when I trust a man. No, I'm not going to trust a man then you're not going to be in accord or in, in the will of unity of God. The devil's already what? Taking you out of the game. That's good. They're on the sidelines. Keep you on the sidelines so you never get the will of God done. What, what happens when God speaks to a man? Well, God didn't speak to me. If God didn't speak to me, then I ain't going. I ain't doing it. So now what? You can't hear from God because you're not in the place of posture to hear from God, and you're waiting to what, hear from God before you move. But until then, you're going to do exactly what you want to do. And what happens in that process? The very gift that God has in you dies. You're dying, you're a dead man walking, don't even know it. That if you don't exercise the very gift, the purpose, and passion God has in your life, you will literally die on your feet. There are too many people who are literally waiting for an early grave because they are, have, have literally pushed the will of God away from them. And they feel that they can defer it for as long as they want to. And I'll tell you a little secret that I knew I would pastor. I knew I would preach the word of God. I knew the, what the word that God had on my life. And it wasn't because a man told me. It was because God told me himself. He gave me the scripture as well. Ezekiel 33. And showed me, I make you a watch. I call you a watchman. If you don't tell my people what I said, and they die in their sins and their blood will I require at your hand. But if you discharge your duty, then they'll retain their own sins. And so now I'm able to what? Just say what I have to say. And even if you don't come into agreement with it, I have what? I have what? Delivered my own soul. So you're responsible and the, your own blood be upon your own heads is what happens. That's what happens with the preaching of the gospel. And it's foolishness to men because he takes the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. He chose the foolishness of the preaching of the gospel to do so. So people say, well, what, what good is preaching? It is the power of God. That's the gospel. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the power of God to salvation to everyone that believes. It's by preaching that what faith comes, and then faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. But how can you hear unless you have a preacher? You have preachers who are sitting down on the job, will not do their job, will not preach the word of God, will not stand in the place of authority, will not stand for God. They're in rebellion and literally have judgment over their head, don't even realize it. Jonah's walking about, going the opposite direction, and then we have to do a three days journey in one day because they refuse to what? Come into agreement, the power of agreement with the word of God. Why? Because I know what you're going to do to them people. I know what it's going to do to me. It's going to cause me to have to sacrifice my life and know I'm not going to sacrifice my lifestyle for you, God. Or them people that you care about warning, them Ninevites who deserve the judgment that they're getting. The power of one, come into agreement with God. But God has to, in the Mosaic pattern, first speak to a man. So that's what God does. He first speaks to the man. This is what he told him in Exodus chapter 4. He said, and the Lord said to Aaron, verse 27, go into the wilderness to meet Moses. 
And he went and met him in the Mount of God and kissed him. And Moses, verse 28, told Aaron all the words of the Lord who had sent him and all the signs which he had commanded him. And Moses and Aaron went and gathered together all the elders of the children of Israel. And Aaron spake all the words which the Lord had spoken to Moses and did signs in the sight of the people. And the people did what? Believe, verse 31. And when they heard that the Lord had visited the children of Israel and that he had looked upon their affliction, then they bowed their heads at worship. So first, God reveals himself in the burning bush to what? who? To Moses. None of the people had that experience. Only Moses knew what God said, and they had to what? Hear from him. Then God, but God calls the man to speak to the people. And so he comes and speaks to the people, and the people bowed their head and worship. They came into agreement with what God said, even though it did not look like what God said would happen, happened, but they came into agreement with the word. The word. It's the modus operandi of God. It's the M, God's MO. It's how he what? He does what he does. He sent his word and it healed them. That's what God does. He speaks a word and he calls people to be healed. So we cannot what? Fall into the trap of saying what? The words aren't important. They are very much important. That is by the word of the Lord that you're here. Word brought you here. Word kept you. Word got you what? Right there in the place where God says, I'm not going to let you down the Bible because I have a word out on your life. I have a word out on your life. So even in your rebellion, I'm not going to let you die. I'm not going to let you down. But what I'm going to do is as many as I love, I'm going to chase it. I'm going to rebuke you. Because if not, you won't become a partaker of my holiness. And so I have to what chasing you. As many as be sons, otherwise you are illegitimate children. Bastard children, he says. So he has to what rebuke. He has to chasten to let you know that what you are his. I'm still talking to you, am I? Yeah. It's M.O. If God starts talk, stop talking to you, you got a problem then. So God speaks to a man, then the man speaks to the people. But this is what the third thing that happens in this power of oneness. That God puts his spirit on the people to accomplish the work. God empowers his people to accomplish the work. What God did is he, he told the people, y'all are going to come out of Israel. And you're going to come out with much spoils. I want you to take all of the things, the goods of the what, Egyptians, and take them out because you're coming out with a great spoil. That even though you were left down in here, I made a promise 430 years ago to your father Abraham, and I'm coming to fulfill it now. I will fulfill my covenant because I promised it to this man, and I am going to bring it to pass. And that's exactly what God did. He brought it to pass to the children of Israel. He calls what another man to be raised up so that he can speak to him, have this man speak to other people, and now the people are now empowered that when he says what, move, they move just like that. He says, I want you to what? Take all your people, take them inside, take the kid, a lamb, under two years, I want you to slay it, I want you to fix it up, and I want you to do it, to fix it with unliving bread, I want you to eat it, eat it fast, have all your clothes on, be ready, because in that time, when I cause this scourge to come up on the land, I'm going to cause the firstborn of every household to be killed, include Pharaoh's household. But where I see the blood of the lamb spread across the doorpost, I will what pass over you. And that's what God said he would do. He will pass over you where he sees the blood. It's not by power that you are what? That you are protected, you are kept. It's not because you are so good that you are kept. There are people who are better than you. Yes, better than you. Have a better moral compass than you do. Don't even know God. You sin even knowing God. Knowing how gracious God is and don't love him. They pray even though they don't know God as God. You have what? The revelation of Jesus Christ and you won't pray. And they know what? They, they, they don't even have that. What does that tell you? It's like Cornelius, a devout man, a devout, a devout Roman who is what? Praying to God and uh, giving alms to the what, people. And then God says what? That, now I'm going to what? Do a new thing. I'm going to send an angel down and speak to him and cause him to what? Go send for Peter. Because I need to what? Get the word to him. Because this is someone who is going to help spread my word. Who is going to come into agreement with what I want to happen here. Are y'all with me today? So, 
God has to then empower his people to do the work. And he did it. Once that scourge came over, they came out, and they came out with great substance. And with all of that substance, they were able to take and build the temple, the tabernacle that God had in the wilderness to worship him. So God speaks to a man, man speaks to a people, and then God empowers the people to do the work. It's the same thing that happened in the New Testament. God gave the commandment. Jesus gave the commandment. He says, who do men say I am? Some say you're a prophet. Some say you're Elias. One, one of those prophets. He said, well, well, who do you say that I, the son of man, am? Yeah. And Peter, the one who was so impulsive amongst them, said, thou art the Christ. Son of the living God. And he says, Blessed are thou, Simon Bar, John of flesh and blood has not revealed this unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. And upon this rock, this truth, that I am the Christ, the Son of the living God, I will build my church, my ecclesia, and the gates of hell, the very gates of hell which they stood in, where devils were worshipped. In Caesarea Philippi, he said, I will build my church and the gates of hell should not prevail against it. And so what God does, he empowers us to, to now have his spirit to take this great courage within ourselves to go to the very gates of hell and take everything that the enemy has stolen from us. He takes that same, very same man. A few minutes later, he falls down and says what? Suffer not to be so, Lord. Don't, don't go give your life. No, I don't want you to die. He says what? Get thee behind me, Satan. You say, that's rough. Why would Jesus talk to a man like that? Isn't that good? Isn't that a good reason for him to go and leave Jesus? Because he didn't talk to him that way. He called him Satan. The same man he just said the Father in heaven spoke through he says what? The devil is talking through him. What does that let you know? That man is fallible, subject to what? Messing up. <laughs> and that's why it's important to know the what? Will of God. If you know the will of God for your life, you will what? Stay in the right path. You will stand in the right path. If you don't stand in the right path, you could be led astray. Like, like what? Tossed to and fro like a what? Like the wind. And this is it's so important that you're not. Throwing what? Back and forth. Toss to and fro. Because what? When, when situations come, clap your hand, Jared in the house. <laughs> when, 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 when the situation comes and you're what? Tossed to and fro, you don't have what? The, the solid foundation that what? That you can stand on. Because Jesus Christ is this ability that we can depend on. But what happens is if you don't have the what? The power of one, one person believe in God for what exactly he said. And then you have a people who will hear the word of the Lord. And then the people who are empowered to the work, you can't go to hell to take what God, <laughs> what, what the devil stole from you. Now what? Your joy, your peace, your children. All what? All in hell. The gates of hell got it. But what? He says upon this rock, this truth that I am the Christ, son of the living God, I will build my what? Church. He says the body of Christ will be able to what? To be agile, hostile, and mobile. We'll be able to go where other people cannot go to take what other people cannot take. That you don't have to take what the enemy has done to you. You can stand up and say, not so, not for my family, not in my house. I refuse to let the enemy take any of my children. <laughs> Glory be to God. Because that is what God says, what our inheritance. He says, what every tongue that rises against you in judgment, he says, you will condemn. This is the inheritance of them that serve the Lord. That is your inheritance. Amen. It's your inheritance to be able to what? Cast down what imagination. It's your inheritance to what? To what? Speak a word and cause what? Those things that be not to happen. Why? Because the word I'm speaking is not out of my flesh. The word I'm speaking is the word of Almighty God. So if I come into agreement, the power of one with God's word, I will see it happen. 
It doesn't matter what it looks like. It doesn't matter what it looks like right now. It may not look right. It may not look how it's supposed to look. But you know that in time, in time, those things will come to pass. I can imagine Pastor Tom Duchelle was in this place called Rhodesia in a time when, what, when, when the, the, the rebels were fighting and then now Mugabe comes into power. He starts as a liberator. Next thing you know, he gets into power. He becomes a dictator. I know he had to what deal with all of what the changes that come in what the outside circumstances. But though the outside circumstances are happening, God didn't call us to what take over governments and what and establish a theocratic rule. God called us to what be witnesses. He said, "I what uh, I've called you To go ye therefore in all, all the world, teaching all nations, baptizing them in the name of what? The Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Teaching them all things I've what? Told you to do. And I'm with you to the very end of the world. So he called you to what? Be witnesses. Yes, but how many of us will witness? How many will be a witness of God's glory? Of God's change that he's had in your life by his spirit? How God is what encouraged you when you were down, when you were weak, when you were in a beggarly element, when God lifted you up, when you did not feel enough. How many would encourage somebody else who are in the same place that you were in? Or will you keep your testimony to yourself? He says we are overcome by the what? The blood of the lamb and by the word of our testimony. But the blood of the lamb has already been shed. Now there's a testimony. Have you been through a test? So you have a what? A testimony? If God brought you to it, he can bring you what? Through it. And it has to be your testimony that God will what? Indeed bring you through it. Yes, I know the servants of this present time, they are not worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed in us. That God has a what? A plan for your life. He has a purpose for your life. And he wants to carry it out through you. But he needs you to come into agreement with him. He needs you to come into agreement with the word that he has put in a man. With the vision he's put into a man. That's been spoken to you so that he can what, empower you. And there's nothing that can be withheld from you if you allow God to empower you. If you allow God to what, take and superimpose himself on you so that you can do your natural and God will be able to do his super. And putting the super with your natural will cause the supernatural to happen. Yes, you will see miracles happen by your hands. We've seen it in this house. Say it. What happened to your daughter? Right? She come in and she had what? Kidney function gone. But God what? By the what? By his healing power. It's not anything that I've done. It's what God is what? Able to do. And if he did it before, he can what? Do it again. God is no respected person. If he done it for one, he will do it for another. And you have to believe God for it. He didn't tell me to what? To, to, to heal every, every person. Uh, uh, tell me to be the what? The healing man. That, that now I'm going to be the healing man everywhere I go. I got one person been healed. I'm going to go everywhere else, and now everybody's going to be healed. Well, if that's the case, go to the hospital. If you're going to raise the dead, go to the graveyard. If everybody's just going to get this. What, what, what am I saying? That there are too many people who become ideologues, that they get so locked in to what God has said that they are not, not mindful of what God is saying because God is yet speaking. God is yet telling us what the next step is, what the next glory is. We're going from glory to glory and from faith to faith that God is causing us to increase. He doesn't want us to stay in the wicked beggarly elements. He don't want us to continue to be children tossed to and fro or those who would still need milk of the word. He says desire the sick work of the milk, milk of the word so you can grow thereby. But afterwards, he said the word of God, the strong word of God, the strong meat is for those who are exercising the word of God. But if you're not exercising the word, you won't even hear. You can't chew, you can't digest what God has for you. And God is trying to give you more. God wants to give you more even now. God put his spirit in the New Testament church in order for them to turn the whole world upside down. This is what the testimony of these people were. That they began to be called Christians at Antioch. It wasn't a, a term of, of uh, endearment. It was a term of derision. They just took it and flipped the name, and now we are called what? Christians because we are Christ-like, Christ followers. They were used to be called people of the way. What, what am I saying? That God has 
a plan for the whole body. It's a corporate work that must be done, and he's willing to empower you, but you have to, what, get into the posture for God to do so for you. Do you know it's hard to kill a dead man when you've already died to yourself? People don't get offended when they're dead. The people who are offended, they're alive, right? <laughs> they're alive to themselves. They, they, you know, how are you going to offend me? If, hey, I don't have no, this, isn't, this ain't my thing. This is what? God's thing. Whatever God says, whatever the master says, that's what we do. What you, what, what God called you the leader. Okay, this is what you said. This is what we're doing. This is where we're going. And, and, and it's not with the what? This is what we call, call the show. It's not showing, uh, how do I put it? This is what he said. He said, there are those that have a form of godliness, meaning they look that way. They look the right part, but they deny the very power thereof, right? It means that, that the proof is in the what? Pudding. Proof is in the pudding. So if you don't know what God called you to do in the body, for the corporate body, for the local assembly, then that is very easy. Go to your leader. But if you don't have right relationship with your leader, then that's the problem. You get the point? How can you hear if you what? If your leader doesn't have, a, have your ear. He said, my sheep hear my what? Voice, another they will not even run to. Well, if, if your, your favorite YouTube preacher got your ear, and they can get you to send $5, but you haven't even considered what, your own leader or his family? Really? When was the last time you sold into your leader's life? When was the last time you truly appreciated your leader? This may seem like self-aggrandizement. I, I, I certainly tell you it's not. Because frankly, I don't, I don't care about money. I don't care about being paid. That is not my goal. My goal is for God's will to be done. But I know that God cannot do that. He cannot do that when you have what? A, a, a root of bitterness in your heart that will cause what? Many to be defiled thereby. That's why he says, be careful in Hebrews. Be careful lest a what? A root of bitterness springing up cause many to be defiled thereby. So what happens? You're not able to come into what? Oneness with your leader because you got an alt. Can we clear up some alts? Any problems between me and thee? Was a problem that, that Jacob and Esau had. Jacob had stole the birthright. He had went through life and found a bigger trickster than himself and his father-in-law Laban. He came back and Esau wanted to kill him, but they came together. He apologized, gave him all of what the substance, and he says, What? Forgive me. He says, Well, let this. He said, What? May the Lord watch between me and thee while we're absent one from another. He said, what? We're at peace now. If you don't have peace with your brother and your sister. See, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you that these are the things that cause us to what? To miss the mark. Cause us to miss what? Moving forward because what? We have an art with a brother or sister. So we choose to what? <laughs> to come and, and play church instead of what? Being the church. We would come and have a form of godliness, but no power that comes from it. Why? Because our households aren't changed. Our children aren't changed. Our lives aren't changed. And what? Our community is not changed. And that is the biggest problem. That, that the, 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 the move of God is not to what? To change the whole world. It's for you to change what? Jerusalem first. Jerusalem where? Right here. Right here in your locale, right here in this place is where God has you to do your work. I'm up here now. Kids, all right? I'm up here. This, this is, this is what, what God wants for you. 
He wants what? The full body to work together so that what? We are able to get more out of the sum of our individual parts than us individually together. So I'm going to give you these points and I'll close. Here, here, here are the keys, seven keys for one person to make a difference. Seven keys to make one per, for one person to make a difference. To make a difference, you must first be selfless. Somebody say selfless. For the selfless, I have Philippians 2 and 5 through 8. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Do you see that? Mm -hmm. This is what we call the kenosis. Uh, it is the emptying out uh, of, of Jesus. He said what? That even though I know I'm God in the what? Flesh, I don't count it robbery to be equal with God, but because I know what has to happen in this place. I have to decrease myself. I have to what? Choose not to pick up and operate in my divinity. There are some people who are leaders, true born leaders, who frankly may even be better leaders than their, their, their leaders. Do you know what God honors? God honors when you what? When you come into subjection with the will of God and says what? <laughs> I'm not going to, what, show my leader up. I'm not going to try to, what, take away from them. I'm not going to try to put them down. I'm going to do all I can to, what, help my leader, to, what, enhance my leadership. Why? Because I know when my leader does better, we all do, what, better. But you can only do that if you're selfless like Jesus was, who said, what, he didn't take upon himself any form of reputation, but he took upon himself the form of a, what, servant, verse 7, and was made in the likeness of men, and being found in the fashion of man, he humbled himself. Somebody say, humility comes before honor. Humility comes before honor. The camera. Humility comes before honor. So God can't honor you if you can't humble yourself. He can't what? He can't do it. Let me tell you, this is what happens with people with pride. Pride is like a cancer. When you're prideful, you cannot what? You cannot admit fault. You can't what? Say I'm sorry. When you can't humble yourself. I'm not talking about the fake humility that says what? When I'm in your face, I'm going to look like I'm, you know, like Debo, right? <laughs> When Debo come, I'll be, I'll be quiet. When we leave, I'll be talking again. <laughs> That's how it was with them lions. <laughs> Bishop and them was, was laughing. They, they, were, they, were, they, were, they were cracking up about how quiet I got when we got them lions. Let me tell you, we done, we done rolled all around. We were rolled all around because we were going to a dam. There's a dam that we we're going to see. Uh, uh, and so the, the dam is where we we're going to sit there and have like dinner watching the sunset over Zimbabwe. Uh, in, in Victoria Falls. And so we're riding through, we see all, see all the stuff, rhinoceros, we see uh, giraffes, we see all these different animals. And then he said, well, let's go by here and see if we can get closest to the water because that's where the animals go to what? To get, uh, to get their thirst satiated. <laughs> and so we come by a gate and before, I'm sitting on the right hand side of this, this, uh, this vehicle. There's no covering, no protection. And soon as they made a turn, literally right on the side of me are two lions, two female lions, sitting on the side of me. You had Bishop, who is a daredevil himself, who making all this noise, and I'm quiet as a mouse. They said, <laughs> they said I ain't never seen Steve that. Yeah, that's right, I respect them lions. So they're cracking up, and I'm what? I'm definitely serious. I'm like, my goodness, boy, these two lines, and they're cracking up, they're cracking jokes, and, and you have the, the, the God who they have no fear at all, and I, and I find, find, find out they don't have no guns either. Like, hold on, how you gonna do the 20 something years you ain't got no gun? You gotta have something to put them down. But, <laughs> so, so they're cracking jokes and everything else, but what, I'm, what am I saying? I'm going to show these animals the respect they deserve. Yeah. 
Because I am not going to make one of them upset. Because I know just with one swift strike what they can do. But unfortunately, many of us are the same way in the church, in the house of God. We won't disrespect somebody to their face, but we'll do it to their back. We'll, we'll put a front on in front of them and then get behind them and start talking about them and tearing them down. That's not good. That's not God. That's not godly. That's fake. That's phony. And that is what? Something that will cause us to not make a difference. Remember, these are the keys to one person making a difference. You have to be selfless, but you can't be selfless if you will not humble yourself under the hand of Almighty God, because in due time, he will what? Exalt you. So number one is what? Selfless. You got to be selfless. Number two is determined. Somebody say determined. Somebody say, say with me, Philippians 4 and 3, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. That gives you a determination that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So it doesn't matter what it looks like, that I know what, that I'm able to accomplish what God said I can accomplish. There are many people who, who give up on going back to school, give up on their education, give up on their business, give up on their what? Their dreams because they are what? They don't have the confidence in themselves and they're not determined enough so they'll what? Give up before they even start. Or they'll start and what? A tough time will come and they don't have the determination to say, I can push through this. I remember a time when I was studying for the bar. We, had this, we were studying. I was studying. I thought I was studying. And then I had a, a, a friend of mine. She said, uh, hey, Steve, wh who are you studying with? I said, I'm studying by myself. She said, well, come study with us. And then I come over with them, and I see how they're studying. I said, oh, y'all study studying. Y'all studying for real. 16-hour days studying, right? Just to what? Be able to pass the bar. So anybody who what, crossed over that line, you know that they what? They really studied to show themselves approved to the floor of the bar, <laughs> right? But what, what am I saying? That, that, that could have been a place that if I wasn't determined, that I couldn't stand up and say, I'm a first time bar passer. That's what I would say to myself. That's what I had on my mirror. I am a first time bar passer. Why? Because I was determined that I was gonna pass this bar and I wasn't gonna come around and do it the second time. I'm doing it what? The first time. You have to be determined. So you have to say, I can do what? All things through Christ which strengtheneth me. So what's the second thing? You have to be determined. Determined. Number three. Number three, say this. You have to be inspired. To make a difference, you have to be inspired. Somebody say inspired. inspired. This is what Psalm 37 says, verse 23 to 25. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholded him with his hand. I've been young and now am old, yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. If you are inspired by the fact that God has you in his hand and he's holding you up, that will what keep you inspired to know that what God is on my side. You have to have some inspiration. Sometimes they say it's 90 percent, 98 percent inspiration, 2 percent perspiration, like 2 percent work, but 98 percent what inspiration. You have to be inspired to do a work. I hope that you are inspired to what change your community. I hope that you are inspired to make sure your children go further than you went in life. I hope you're inspired to live out the best life that God has for you, to live out the purpose he has for your life, because you need some inspiration, because sometimes this thing gets down. I can tell you there's some valleys. I've been on some mountaintops this past week. Two weeks has been a, a mountaintop experience. But there are some valleys that come in this life that will make you feel like, man, is this even worth it? It will tell you it, maybe life would be better if, if I wasn't here. If I can extract myself from it all, the pressures and the weight of the world. And all that is is the trick of the enemy that what comes to what needle you in your lowest time. All that is is a what valley experience. But what you have to say to what surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. You have to know that what the goodness and mercy of God is following you even when you're in the valley. He's the God of the mountain. He's the God of the valley. When things go wrong, he'll make them right. He's the God of the good times and the God of the bad times. For the God of the day, 
He's the God of the night. That's from my uh, St. Kitts uh, brothers and sisters. Amen. You have to be inspired. There has to be inspiration that pushes you, even when you, it doesn't seem like all things are working out for your good. You have to know and be inspired to know that I've been young and now I'm old, but I've never seen the word righteous forsaken. And, and the thing is, you have to live long enough to, to, to really get this down in your spirit because it would seem, and I, I had, and I've, I've, I've really like, I evaluated some people's lives and said, uh, I don't know about all that. You know, I'm evaluating it from this standpoint. It don't look like all things are working together. But when you really understand the scripture, you know that that's not uh, a temporal thing. That's an eternal promise. So it won't always look that way. But you know if God is with you, who can be against you? Let me, let me go to number four. Number four, you have to be courageous. Somebody be courageous. Somebody say, I must be courageous. In order to be a difference maker, to make a difference, you have to be courageous. Joshua 1 and 9 says, haven't I not commanded you to be strong and courageous? Do not be afraid and do not be discouraged for the Lord your God will be with you wherever, wherever so ever you go. Do you know Joshua had the unenviable task of following such a great leader like Moses? He had to follow Moses' footsteps. Do you know how great Moses was in the eye of the people? Even when Moses came and he laid his hand on, on Joshua in the sight of the people, God understood he had to do it because what? The people probably wouldn't follow Joshua. Yeah. If what? God didn't say this is what was right, that Moses had to what? Pass it on to him. So what am I saying? that Joshua had to have some apprehension. There's no reason for God to tell somebody to be courageous if they were, had no fear. But he had to tell them, what? do not fear. God is with you. Be courageous. Only be of good courage. Because you're about to go and fight against those giants that the evil report came back with. That they, you remember the, ten, the 12 spies that went in to go spy the land and they saw what, that, how big and how great these giants were? They said, what? Weren't they in our eyes like like?" We, we're like grasshoppers in their eyes. You can tell they were projecting, <laughs> projecting their, their what, diminutive stature based on what the, the enemy looking so big. But there has to be somebody who will say, greater is he that is in me than he that is what? In the world. Courageous. You got to be courageous. You have to have, what, what, what does a lion lack? Courage. You have to have what? Some courage. Like what the cowardly lion had to have in the Wizard of Oz. You need what? Courage to make it. You have to literally look what? Look the enemy in the eyes and know that God has given you the strength to overcome it because you're not doing it in your own strength. God is doing it through you. Number five, number five. I'm almost there. You have to be self motivated. Somebody say self motivated. When Jesus was, was going about and he was, came to the woman at the well, his disciples had been sent off to go get some food because Jesus was hungry. And now what? He has his discourse for, with his woman. And now the whole city knows about the, him being the Christ. And then they come back. They say, what? Uh, G, G, who, gave, who gave Jesus something to eat while we were gone? He says, my meat. This is, this is what he says, right? My food, my meat, John 4, 34, is to do the will of him that sent me and to complete the work. My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish the work. That God has it in his spirit that what? That you will be literally fulfilled. Many of us have not seen fulfillment, how God can give it, until we actually start to act in our purpose. If you've been called to sing, you need to sing. Sing to the glory of God. Why? Because if you don't, what will happen? That you will die within yourself. But when you do exercise, it has the opposite effect. That you will find that you are what? You have been moved in this what? In this motivation, self-motivation. It literally motivates you in doing so. So I don't care if anybody else is not encouraged. I'm encouraging the Lord by preaching the word of God. Why? Because that's my gift that God gave me to what? To encourage what? The body, but I am encouraged when I do what God called me to do. But at some point in time, you cannot wait on somebody else to motivate you. You have to be self-motivated. Jesus was concerned with pleasing the Father, and so we should be motivated by the self-same concern. He did the Father's will, motivated by pleasing him 
through obedience. You remember, I always do the will of my father. I must always be about my father's business. His obedience extended all the way to the cross when he humbled himself and became obedient unto death. So our motivation should be the same as his, to be obedient by which we prove we are truly his. Because if you love me, you will keep my commandments, and my commandments are not grievous unto you. Here's the sixth thing. We have to be purposeful. Somebody say purposeful. Purposeful. John, Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, said the Lord, thoughts of good or peace and not evil, to bring you to an expected end. This is one we use to what? To say that God has a purpose for my life and we should have a purpose-driven life. But this was really spoken to the people of Israel when they were in Babylonian captivity. That he says, what, 70 years I've numbered upon you. That, that what? That you're going to be in bondage for 70 years. But I know the thoughts I have towards you. So even if you're in a state that you don't like to be in, I have you there for a purpose. Why? Because I know if I brought you out before time, you will have the same heart you had before to rebel against me, rebel against my covenant, and then you'll be worse off than you were before. But if I keep you in here, I keep you in the fire for long enough, you will come through as pure gold. Yes, because I will burn the impurities out of you, and you will now have a new song. You will have a new feel to your life because now you'll be living to the glory of God. Somebody say, be purposeful. But you are a chosen people. Chosen people. Right? That's what first that's first Peter 29. You are chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may be, be may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. That God does not just call us singly, he calls us as a corporate body. He says, You are a chosen people, you are kings and priests. You are kings and queens. You are priests before God. So, you know, that's two different things. That's two different anointings. That's like David, the Davidic anointing. He was a prophet, priest, and king. He was, he was a king, so he ruled and reigned people. You have a king, you have the what? The territory, you have the subjects. But then you have what? That's a, an anointing for government. Now you have an anointing for what? For ministering to God. That You are a priest. That means you come and you offer sacrifices of praise to God. He says, we all are, corporately, a chosen people. We are a royal priesthood. We are a holy nation. Not unholy, holy nation. We're God's special possession. We are a peculiar people. So if you know who you are and whose you are, then you also know who you are not and whose you are not. You'll find yourself in your own lane doing what you were purposed to do. You can't look out to the Joneses and say, well, it looked great that they're doing all this and that. Yes, it looks great for them to do it because that's what they were called to do. What about you? Where did God call you at? Man, I love how their marriage, their marriage looks so great over there. My goodness, I wish our marriage would be like that. Are you willing to sacrifice? Are you willing to submit? Are you willing to love? Are you willing to take the hit? Are you willing to do those things that, that will bring what? A good marriage into what? In, into being. Because it sets the atmosphere. Do you know that's all about sacrifice? If you don't want to sacrifice, you will never have it. You can look on somebody, people, and tell other people and, and want to have it. You will never have it unless you're willing to sacrifice for it. Are you willing to go to counseling? Are you willing to see what somebody else will objectively say about looking at you and your behaviors? When, somebody, when, when you have to have the person who's closer to you get to lay next to you every single day and see you, they're the best testimony in, in court against you and testify of how ugly you are, how nasty you are, and how much you are not acting like a child of God. Nope, you don't want that, so we are not going to counseling. Get the point? And that's the reason why people stay exactly where they are and what wish for what other people have and put on airs and put on fronts for other folks. No, ma'am. No, sir. That is not what God called us to. God calls us to it. Ephesians 5. That's what Ephesians 5 says. What? Husbands love your what? Wives, even as Christ loved the church and gave his what? Own life for it. That means he'll sacrifice for his life. That means he'll sacrifice. That sacrifice is also for your emotional well-being. It's, it's, it's all, also for how you feel, how I make you feel. Yeah. 
Do you know that that's one of the, the biggest areas I've had to work on in my ministry? Not out here, in my own what personal life. Why? Because God is concerned about the spiritual, the moral, and, uh, and, and certainly financial welfare of, of us all. That moral welfare is about how we treat each other, how we treat each other in our lives, in our marriages, how we treat our children. Do we provoke our children to wrath? I know I, I, like, I like, you know, <laughs> ribbing a little bit, and I have to be careful in my flesh because I don't want to, what, turn my child off. You get the point? Because I, I think I'm playing, and then, then they're really hurt. So what, I have to, what, condescend the men of low estate. I have to, what, take the, what, back road. I have to take the, what, off road because I can't, what, just say, well, hey, I'm the man, and that's where it's going to be. Okay, you be the man by yourself. You be the that that's what it is. Yeah. Do you know who 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 actually brought that to my attention? Bishop Vaughn McLaughlin. He did. When you see somebody who's been been in a marriage for forty five years, never slammed the door, never had a, a argument like a a, a a a sideways word, because they don't preach what they practice. They practice what they preach. See, I was used to being religious. I had to recognize I had a religious spirit, right? You have to confront these things. That's the only, the only way it's going to happen. You have to confront these things and say, well, I was more so concerned with how people viewed me than what? What the situation actually was. I was more concerned with what? What y'all would say about what me and my wife. But when I came to a point where I realized I needed what my wife to help me become who God called me to be, because he says any man who finds a wife finds a good thing and it obtains what favor from the Lord. I didn't have favor because I wouldn't let my wife be my wife. So now I call her Holy Ghost 2.0. If the Holy Ghost won't get me, she will. She will make me consider some things. It don't mean she's already right. It just means I have to what? Consider if I'm going to be the head, I'm going to have to be a good leader of my household. That's a whole house. Because if I can't rule my house well, how can I rule the house of God? This is about being purposeful. This is number six. If one man is going to make a difference, you're going to have to be purposeful. I'm going to have to live a purpose-driven life in this situation. Every area of my life has to what? Go under the microscope. Somebody has to be able to what? See me, correct me. Well, I'm the pastor. I ain't got to be correct because I ain't got nobody to look over me. Forget that all that. I get out of this ministry, I ain't, got, I ain't got to have nobody look over me. And that's what most people do. And then you see that life come to ruin. You see many, many preachers, great preachers, great leaders, their lives fall apart. Their marriages fall apart because they've been playing a game. They've been playing a game with the enemy, with the enemy's tools, and then they get the, the result of it. It don't say bad things don't happen to good people when you're doing good. What I'm saying is when you do what's right, it will always work out eventually. Purpose-driven life. Instructions of the Lord. The Bible says it's like gold fasteners that fasten you into place so you do not move. That's living a principled life. That I don't care what people say when, what, when, when, when uh, come hell or high water. If I've done it, what, God's way. And if I know God has me on the microscope, God has me on the potter's wheel, that he's going to, what, form me from a vessel of dishonor into a vessel of honor. Instead, from a vessel that was fit for destruction to a vessel fit to be used for God's purposes. Somebody say, be purposeful. Here, here's the last one, the last word, last word. I'm going to give you a big word here. I'm going to give you a big word here. You got to be undefatic. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm going to get it out now. Use a big word. <laughs> I said it this morning. I'm going to use a better word, a word I can say even better. <laughs> it's called indefatigable, right? But I'm going to say untiring. Somebody say untiring. 
<laughs> Indefatigable, right? That means you're unable to be fatigued, right? You never tire. So let's just say untiring. Number seven is untiring, because I, I, yeah, untiring. That's what we're going to use, all right? <laughs> Praise God. So we're going to be untiring. This is the seventh thing, last thing. You have to be untiring. Galatians 6 and 9 says this, and let us not be weary in well-doing. For in what? Due season. We will reap if we faint not. Isaiah 40 and 31 says this, but they that wait upon the Lord shall do what? Renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and shall not faint. That, that sometimes on this journey in life, we do get tired. I don't know how many times I want to just pull over on the side of the road and say, man, y'all just go ahead without me. <laughs> y'all can have that. Maybe, maybe if God like Enoch just come and decided what, just carry me on the way. That'll be better. And y'all can just go ahead and walk this thing on out and we'll see what the end is going to be. But sometimes when you're getting weary like that, just like Elijah after he had had a mountaintop experience come down and now he's, he's tired, he's drained, and now he's scared for his life. Jezebel's on, on his foot. He's gotten to a place where he's, he's hungry. And God has to now settle his, in his spirit and speak to him. And God has to send an angel to come and minister to him. The same way that God sent an angel to minister to Jesus in the wilderness after he had been hungering for 40 days and 40 nights. That sometimes we will get tired. But we still have to be untiring. That even when we're doing good, we cannot get weary in well-doing. It's due season. That's the time when God said that it's reaping season, that it's time for you to see the what? The fruit of all your labor, and you have to get to that time. But sometimes it seems like it's supposed to be that time, and it don't get there in time. It's time for your heart not to grow faint or weary. But that's why the body of Christ is supposed to be one that when we fall down, somebody else is what? Able to raise us up, lift us up. It's not just an accountability piece. It's an encouragement piece. That, that, yes, we're supposed to encourage ourselves in the Lord, but we have to, what, lift each other up when we see each other down. We cannot be so separate and separated and apart that, what, it's all about me, myself, and I. No man is an island unto himself, but if you operate in that way, nobody can feel you. Nobody will feel your pain. And then what happens? You feel like you're out here all alone, and you start to sing that, what, you got the world smaller violin. Nobody knows. No trouble I've seen, nobody knows my sorrows. It's the same feeling that the, the Israelites had when they were taken into Babylonian captivity, and they said, sing us some of those Zion songs. They put their, their, their harps in the willow trees, and, the, and these captives were, were, were taunting them. Sing us some of them good old Zion songs. And they said, how can we sing Zion songs in a strange land? Yeah. That's how it feels sometimes. How can I what, sing a song of praise and of gratitude and thanksgiving when I'm not in the place that I want to be? When I'm what, in a place of discouragement, when I'm in a place that, that I feel that well, I should have been past this. But I'm still what, right here stuck in this rut and I can't get out of it. But doing the same thing, expecting different results, is insanity. At some point in time, you have to do it God's way. Somebody say, tell, tell somebody else to do it God's way. Because if you do it God's way, you won't get tired. You won't give up. They that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings of eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. That, that we have to wait upon the Lord, I say. Wait upon the Lord. And be of good courage, and he will strengthen your heart. That, that Christ came and did something. That one man, the power of one, he came and did something that the one man had what messed up. That was our, our base scripture. That, that, that Jesus in Romans 5, it talks about where by one man sin entered the world. And death came by sin, and death passed on all men, for that all have sinned. Thereby, the offense of one judgment came upon all men, condemnation. All this was from Adam. 
The power of what? One. What difference can one man make? Look at what difference this one man made. That this, all this has what? Spread across the whole world. That we are subject, the creature was made subject to vanity, not willing. We have to come and deal with these things and have to have a theodicy, an understanding of God's goodness in the midst of all the evil that happens in the world. Why does all these people have to die in a hurricane? Why are all these people being killed in mass shootings? Why is all these fires breaking out in other places? Why is all this calamity going on? Does God not care for us when we go through all these things? No, it's not because God doesn't care. It's because what the power of one one man's disobedience one man stepping out of the will of God one man doing what he wanted to do in his own strength and look at what happened what happened you have the what power of your choices but you cannot choose your consequences but the wages of sin is death here's the great great thing about that scripture it only in there it says what but the gift of God is what eternal life and that gift was in the form of his son Jesus Christ the power of one who came who lived a sin and impeccable life and he died on the cross for our sins and he what rose up on the third day with all power in his hand so he now reigns as God that at the name of Jesus, every knee must bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord to the glory of the Father. And if we believe that, then we rise in power with him. When we're baptized and go down in the water of the grave, we come up in the newness of life and now live to Christ. So that I crawl, the life that we live is no longer I, but Christ who died for me, the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That is what, what the power of one can do. That the power of one can come and undo all that the what another has done. And so I'm looking for one person, one man who will stand up. God said, I was looking for one, anybody who will come and stand in the hedge, anybody who will be an intercessor. I wanted there was none. And he said, well, my own self, I brought salvation. By my own arm, I came and I brought it. Because God had to what, do it himself. And he did it by Jesus Christ. And for that, we ought to be grateful to God. That's what the power of one can do. What difference can one man make? It makes a whole lot of difference. If you ask those who have come to salvation by your testimony, what difference can one man make? If you have any fruit to your account, who do you know that has been saved by your witness? Can you go to them and ask them, what have I been to your life? What has that word that came in due season and the right season meant to your life? If you don't have anybody you can call on like that, I can tell you what it's like. Because God has used me to what? To bring somebody to the cross. And it wasn't something that just happened by happenstance. No, it was something that was intentional. It was purposeful. Because God wanted them to, to live. Instead of using somebody else, I was what open and available and God used me for it. And I can ask him, what is the power of one person at that right time, speaking the right word in that due season? Planting that seed, coming and watering, and watching God give the increase. Yes, sir. You will find that they are so grateful for your life. But the problem is, you can't get out of your own way. If you get out of your own way, you will find. You will find that there is a great reward that comes for being submitted to God, for coming into corporate dynamic so that the, what, the community can change. Because first you have to change, and then the, what, the community around you changes. And then you yourself become a world changer. From the many examples we have, one man and a woman can make a difference. They truly can. All standing. But they are never alone. They require the assistance of others who will take hold to the vision and work together for a collective goal. But God has to empower you. I believe God is specifically mandated and given leadership for the purpose of bringing greater glory to his name. The mark of a great leader is those who have been great followers. Until we are the visionary leader. God has spoken to for the hour. We have to submit ourselves to the leadership of others and defer knowing that our collective efforts 
will greatly outpace our individual efforts. We can go all about our individual lives and continue to watch the world burn around us from poor leadership, bad government, bad personal habits, lack of education, training and experience, and the tools necessary for people around us to prosper. But God has put too much in us for us to what? Hold it all to ourselves and not truly impact this community. If our church was swept up out of here and it didn't exist anymore, here's the question I would ask you. Would anybody even notice? If the answer to that is no, it's a sad indictment on us all. But the next question I ask is, if every person in the church is like you, if every person in this church was like you, would that be the reason the community didn't know? I believe it's time for us to come together and say this is the place that God has ordained me to be. This is a collective effort God has called us to. This is the leader God has placed in my life. I will walk in lockstep and accomplish all that God has ordained for my life, for our lives collectively. My will is whatever God's will is. When we have a collective people who are willing to do that, we will become Christ's representatives in the earth. In our community, we will become indispensable and the salvation of many will be to our accounts. Father, we pray right now that you will cause, Lord God, the seed sown to go on into the hearts of many. If any are offended, Lord God, let the offense, Lord God, bring them to conviction. Let that confrontation bring them to conviction and conviction to bring them to conversion and they'll be converted that they'll be saved. Cause all of us to come into alignment with your will individually and collectively. We know that by the power of one, sin entered the world. But that by the power of one, sin was a problem taken care of and death as well. So that grace could reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Thank you for what you did. Thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for the great examples in the earth that we're able to look to and know that it is possible to be a life changer, to be a community changer, to be a world changer. And I pray you'll do it through these. I, under the sound of my voice, I give you praise in Jesus' matchless name. Thank God. Amen. Oh, he saw the best in me when everyone around, when everyone else around, when everyone else around could only see the worst in me. Yes, God sees the best in you. It's the reason why he has us around. God sees the best in you. You got to know that God knows he has a seed of righteousness in you. God just want to bring it forth out of you. Come out, out of your graves. Come out of your graves. Be resurrected unto life. Allow God's spirit to empower you. To empower you for life. Now, for those who are watching online, we thank God for you all being here with us. We pray that something, the words that were spoken to you, resonate in your hearts. If you'd like to give your life to the Lord, let us know. Send us a message. He said, if you believe in your heart, the Lord Jesus, and confess with your mouth that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Let us know that God has done in your life through this word. And for those who need a place to worship, if people need a place to worship, please 
consider to worship with us. Our doors hang on the hinges of welcome. You're always welcome. If you don't have a place of worship or your place is worshiping online only, he said, forsake not yourself to assemble together as the custom is for others. And so this is about us being together. It's when we come together in the presence that God manifests his presence in the midst of us. Amen. Amen. For those who would like to give towards this work, you may do so on, by the sign on the line. It helps about. You can we give by Cash App, Cash Sign, Hepsabah, EPC, or you can give by Givelify. Givelify searches out in the Jacksonville, Florida area. As well, you can give online, h-epc.org. Click on the Donate tab. It will take you to a secure link, and you can give in that manner. Thank God for you being here with us. We pray that you understand now the power of one. What difference can one man make? We're going to make a great difference. And that's what God is calling us to do. We give God glory. God bless you. God keep you. God face shine upon you. In Jesus' name.